Then over to Sharon Hom. Uh, this will be more hands-on um, uh, human rights uh, work. And Sharon, I've read a couple of interviews with you uh, the last 24 hours. And there are two words coming up over and over again, crossroads or watershed. Uh, what would you say about that? Please, Sharon. Is this the clicker? Yeah, we're good. We can do the first. Thank you. Um, my Norwegian is terrible, uh, so I didn't know what, how my interviews translated, <laughs> but uh, I did not say watershed. I said crossroad. And uh, what I actually said was that, uh, as for my reaction on the Nobel Peace Prize, not to sound like the Communist Party, but I said there are three rights. And I said it's the right moment, it's the right person, and it's encouraging the right direction. Um, so uh, that's my uh, comment, and I think that the whole uh, comment about the crossroads is, uh, I, I hope that uh, my remarks and sharing some of our work will give you a sense of a uh, more concrete, nuanced sense of what I mean by crossroads. I'm not talking about a theoretical, conceptual place. I'm talking about a very complex, fluid, volatile landscape. And we are at the crossroads of it. Um, but I do want to um, say quickly that I would like to very much thank uh, the Fried Wood uh, for inviting us and giving us this opportunity. Uh, you may not know, I, I really wasn't invited after October 8th. I had uh, been invited much earlier. And then October 8th, suddenly it gave a very different dimension of um, the opportunity for me to be here to speak with uh, Norwegian citizens. So it is just a very special opportunity. And I want to thank Beta and the amazing hosts uh, at Fried Ord. Um, though it wasn't to us, meaning us human rights in China, I, I do want to thank the Nobel Peace Prize Committee for the extraordinary message of hope it has given to all of us working in the field. And I don't mean just in China, I mean all of us working on these issues in the world because they're interrelated. And um, finally, I wanna thank all of you uh, for making the time to come out. And I do hope that you will stay for the film, uh, the documentary, because we produced it. And it's 25 minutes based on 30 hours of interviews that the Tiananmen mothers, who are family members of those who died, uh, their children, their wives, their husbands, their relatives who died in, uh, on June 4th and afterwards. So they decided to shoot their own interviews, to tell their own stories. And so they gave us the 30 hours and asked us to um, produce uh, a, um, originally a three, four hour documentary out of the th 30 hours that we could give to the international community. And we explained to them that probably no one would watch three to four hours but that we might do 25 minutes. So that's what we've produced. And we do hope you stay to, um, to share that. Um, because Greg started, as usual, put us into a very sophisticated technological discussion, and I am not a technologist. Um, I do want to pick up a couple of things of it briefly, that uh, after this and during the reception, um, we urge that all of you, we brought you this is, a, uh, this is our quarterly journal. It's bilingual Chinese and English. Good thing I have it here so that I can talk while Oscar's trying to connect us. Mm -hmm. um, and we um, translated um, the six articles by Liu Xiaobo, Charter 08, and all of the legal documents in his trial and appeal and his final statement. And we thought it was very important. Let's not talk about freedom of expression in a vacuum. Let's read what is being contested. And let's read what gets you 11 years prison in China. And the best is not for me to tell you, it's for you to read it. So uh, I would urge you to um, pick up this later. Are we up online? This goes to show why it is not technology that will bring freedom and democracy to China. <laughs> and at the end of the day, we take our own little two sticks and make the fire and like start the um, process. So th this really is true. It's sort of a joke, but it's really true that at the end of the day, the technology is in the hands of humans. And the technology that is being used by the Chinese authorities is used for different purposes than when Liu Xiaobo posted his six articles online. And those six articles were posted on our website and on another website, Guangxia. And th those, our website and the other website is blocked in China. 
which means that, that if you're in China and you don't have a circumvention tool, you will not get to read Li Xiaobo's article. Yet the, those articles posted on banned websites um, that Chinese citizens could not easily access and of which the Chinese were monitoring because if you read the court indictment, it says they got 57 clicks. That's not a lot of people. That's less than half the people in, uh, tonight at this seminar. And some of the articles got like 5,000 like at the top. So that means for 11 years, at articles posted on a banned website overseas, uh, that 57 to possibly 5,000 people might have read uh, resulted in this 11-year prison sentence. Uh, and I think that gives you a sense of both the ways in which the internet was able to be the vehicle for Liu Xiaobo to take his voice and put it out there that sometimes technology can bring your message to the people. And, uh, but it also was the tool for the Chinese government to be able to monitor, surveillance, and count the clicks. So um, let me um, uh, start and back up a bit and put this into some context. Thank you, Meta. This is my colleague, Meta, who, as you can tell because of her name, she is Danish and has kept me very much on time, which is very Scandinavian, so not Asian. You know, if you go to an Asian banquet and you show up at 7 because they said come at 7, you will be the only person there. You know, about an hour later, it will start coming in, you know, so thank you, Mela. So uh, let me uh, pull it back, and what I would like to do is put this discussion of freedom of expression and what's happening in China in context. And the context I want to start with is international. And that context, this was already been referred to, is um, freedom of expression under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International um, Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which China has signed and promised for almost a decade that they will ratify. But basically, once you sign an international convention, it means you cannot do anything that goes against the sense and the basic values and the core of that. And the only thing I want to point out about our discussion today is that freedom of expression includes not only the right to your opinion and expression, it includes the right to receive and impart information and ideas. So that's where you get this notion of right to information, that is to get it and to disseminate it. And that is an internationally established, recognized right with a cluster, and this is also related to the right to privacy. Because if you don't have privacy of your communication, then it's not secure what you import and what you impart and what you receive. And it can get you in quite a bit of trouble in China if there's no privacy of what you're reading, writing, or disseminating. 